Hello and namaste guys. I am Dr. Anushruti and I am back with an amazing episode. Well, I know that you are suffering from lower back pain. Yes, I know that. Or maybe your kids are suffering from lower back pain or your parents are suffering from lower back pain, your friends are suffering from lower back pain, your relatives are suffering from lower back pain. In a nutshell, every other person is suffering from lower back pain. But do you know why does this happen? Or why is it happening to you? Or how can you manage it? Well, to answer all these questions and make this easier for you, today on board, I have Dr. Ben with me. He is a physical therapist and strength and conditioning specialist. Well, when we have such a pioneer of this profession with us, why would we leave a chance to speak to him? Let's directly speak to him. Hello, Dr. Ben. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for having me. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you so much. Well, I really want to know, as the today's, you know, the theme suggests lower back pain. What exactly is lower back pain known as? Like, how do we know that we have a lower back pain? Yeah, low back pain, pain uh, definition in and of itself is, is pretty nebulous. Um, you know, really, typically in the, in the research, it's anything between the bottom of the rib cage and the top of the pelvis, kind of globally through there. Um, most folks, you know, they're, they're immediately going to say low back pain. Uh, they're going to know what that is. There, there's not going to be too much of a mystery around that just because of how common it is. So we see it's, uh, extremely common, you know, different research sites, different statistics, but we do know it's the, the number one cause of disability worldwide. Um, especially in the U S Australia, we, we have a growing chronic low back pain epidemic more or less. So yeah, almost everybody is bound to have low back pain at some point in their life. Uh, we, we call the folks that don't have low back pain ever unicorns. Those are the folks we're trying to study um, because it's, it's just not very common. Uh, most folks have low back pain just like they have the common cold, right? And we can talk about some of the things that are, are common with that. But um, low back pain, very, very common, very, very prevalent. Um, and that's why it's important to have strategies to be able to self-manage low back pain because it is likely to, to occur so much and reoccur. And why does this, you know, occur so much? Like, what is the thing behind it to be occurring so much for people? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I, I wish I had the answer for you. Um, there's been a lot of discussion around this. Different people have different thoughts. You know, originally, we, we would assume that it was wear and tear. It was tissue damage. You know, the old saying goes in the 1910s, 1920s, we, we started getting some new technology with x-rays. And we were finally able to take a look at what was, what was under the hood, you know, metaphorically. And what we could see was bones, right? We could see the bone, we could see the facet joint. So we assumed, okay, that must be where the pain's coming from. That must be the, the, the pain generator. And then, you know, fast forward to, gosh, uh, 70s, 80s, 90s or so, we got started getting MRI and now we can look at, at soft tissues. So we started seeing soft tissues and we're like, you know what? We were a little, little quick to, to blame the facet joints to blame the bones is actually the the disc right now we can see these these discs that must be the the pain generator and now in the 2000s where we're getting these fmris and now we can start seeing the brain and now we're just blaming the brain so we're continually on this this hunt to to kind of be less wrong overall you know as a as a healthcare uh, entity in, in general so nobody really knows for sure why we have pain but the one thing that we are learning as we continue o over time, you know, going from that 1900s X-ray, fast forward to, to fMRIs, and, and even with some blood tests we're doing now with um, different microglia and endocrine immune cascades, is, is we're seeing there's more and more layers over this. I always look at it as far as like a Russian doll model. But um, with the layers, we're just trying to appreciate complexity and, and trying to realize that it's not as simple as, as one thing. It's not as simple as the facet joint. It's not as simple as the disc. It's not as simple as the brain, right? That's, that's kind of the new uh, flavor, flavor of the moment right now. But um, yeah, usually when folks ask me why they have low back pain, that's where, you know, we're really trying to, to use that narrative-based medicine where we're, you're, we're hearing their story and we're hearing their story well. And we're trying to use that story and make some sense with them, with, with their story. 
you know, there's not going to be a one size fits all approach. There's not going to be one metaphor that's going to yeah. work for everybody. But um, oftentimes I, I do like to use the allostatic load model, which, which is the cup model. Some f folks may be familiar with. Um, do you want me to go into that? No. So, so the, the cup model is essentially when, if you think about the human as a cup, there's a certain amount of fluid that can be in that cup before it overflows. And when it overflows, that's when we may be more likely to have the common cold, um, stress, anxiety, depression, pain as well, similar to a headache. Um, and, and all those things in the cup are different for everybody. Some of them are sleep, nutrition, diet, relationships, finances, um, stressors in general overall, um, self-care routines, things of that sort. So sometimes that cup just overflows. And, and that's when we may be more likely to have pain. And I like that model because it gives us a lot of opportunity of things that we can change. There's not just one thing that we have to change. There's maybe five, 10, 15 things that we have the option to change overall. Um, and, and, you know, it works for some folks. Some folks, there's no change and, and pain develops. Um, so that can be a little trickier and a little bit more frustrating. But the main thing is I'm trying to make sense of their story with them. So there's some type of coherence, some type of sense making that can move them forward from where they are now to where they want to be. Exactly. So don't you think that it is strange that even the young kids, the younger population are having lower back pain. I mean, I have come across personally a lot of kids, you know, school going kids who complain of lower back pain. Now, what their parents has to say, have to say is that it is because of carrying school bag weight or playing certain sport or game. Like, don't you feel that this is kind of strange? And this has increased, you know, the, I would say consistency or, uh, you know, the happening of lower back pain in younger kids have increased after the onset of coronavirus. So what do you think about this? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Um, you know, anytime, you know, I guess even if we rewind and we think about wear and tear, the, the traditional kind of stories around why we have pain, which, which we know are just a, such a small piece of the puzzle. Um, kids are interesting because they don't have that, that wear and tear overall. You know, th there's some changes in, in tissues, but very minuscule compared to uh, the typical narrative. So yeah, that is interesting seeing uh, pain rates increase in, in, in children. I haven't seen um, research per se much with that, but there's not much research on, on children either. So it is hard to say. Typically, you will hear those narratives about the backpacks, things of that sort. Um, and, and I'm not really sure. You know, the one thing I would say in a sport context Sometimes structure does matter a little bit more with children. So we think see things like uh, spondylolysis, spondylolisthesis that are more acute, essentially stress fractures with these younger children. Um, so anytime that I am seeing a, a younger person, maybe age you know, 25 and below, I always do wanna make sure that I'm making sure I'm ruling out these red flags, things like stress fractures, things of that sort, because it is more rare for them to, to have um, more of this allostatic load uh, contribution to that pain experience just because they're younger that doesn't mean it doesn't happen you know especially right now we are seeing um, anxiety stress depression rising mm -hmm. in, in young folks and there's different talks with that um, with technology and TikTok and uh, just constantly comparing themselves to, to others and, and things of that sort so I think that likely is a big driver um, but I think the jury's still out with that and that is one thing that I, I do find very interesting just because there is a, a different proportion of things that could potentially be going on in that cup for a, a young person versus an older adult. Absolutely. Moving on, Dr. Ben, I have a fine fettle question for you. Since this episode is sponsored by Fine Fettle, so we are having a fine fettle question for you. And the question is, does posture matter? So is your posture, is someone's posture triggering their lower back pain? Yeah, good question. And this is where, where words and semantics matter a little bit more. So if we're going to say trigger, I think posture can play a role. Um, when I was in physical therapy school, you know, this is when I was starting to read all the, the posture research. And, and we were still taught that posture 100% matters all the time. You need to be in this perfect plumb line posture. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're predisposing yourself to pain. Um, and all the research was just completely disagreeing with that. And I, and I had a very strong stance against posture, where, where posture does not matter at all. But I don't think that's completely fair either. I think posture certainly plays a role. Um, is it causative? I don't think so. And the research would say no. But 
I think it can be a factor. And what I mean by that is, yeah. is when we hurt, some positions are more comfortable, some positions are less comfortable, right? So if we say posture never matters, that's not completely fair. But I really do like the the old saying, the next posture is the best posture. Uh, motion is lotion, because anytime you're in one posture for too long, then your your nervous system, it's not getting space, oxygen, blood flow. And now we are getting a little bit of metabolic product byproduct maybe these acid sensing ion channels are accumulating with some acidity and our body just wants to move a little bit so i think using that and and allowing patients to explore different postures giving them permission to really kind of touch all those different options can give them more flexibility versus you know really sticking to oh i always have to be in this one perfect posture oh, otherwise that... I'm doomed. absolutely great well, moving on, Dr. Ben, let's get into the segment of my show where you are going to tell me if it is a myth or a fact. Now, what happens in this segment is I have a bunch of Instagram posts ready with me for you. You know, you would have come across Instagram pages who claim to be doctors, with, I mean, without any degree, without any examination, they claim to be doctors and they post certain Instagram uh, photos where they describe some medical advices. So when I have a professional with you, why would I miss this chance? So you have to tell me if this post stays the myth factor or the fact factor. So if it is a myth or a fact, you need to tell me why is it so? So okay. are we ready to go? Let's hear it. Okay. So the first post says, okay, lifting heavy weights make you have lower back pain. Oh, and I have to pick myth or fact. I can't do nuance. <laughs> uh, myth. It, it is a myth. So what do you want to suggest the listeners right now? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say lifting weight, I would say dosage, dose doing too much too soon or for too little for too long can predispose you. Um, but if it's the optimal dosage, that's only going to make you stronger, fitter, healthier overall. So it's all about that dosage versus the actual movement or the actual weight per se. Okay, moving on, the another post says not following ergonomics while working and studying makes you have lower back pain. False. I'll just leave it that is one a false. <laughs> Okay, great. We have great posts. Okay, so next post says, doing some standing exercises for your lower back brain has been proven to be helpful to the patients. Standing? Exercises. Um, I'm sure it could be. Yeah, <laughs> there, there, there's so many things that can help with low back pain. Um, that uh, yeah, almost almost anything can help. We have options, and that's why it's really about patient preferences and values, um, yes. and, and where they're at right now. Absolutely. Next, we have next post says, okay, the only remedy to cure your lower back pain is to make certain lifestyle changes in your routine. Hmm. I think that's an option and I think it's a good option, but I don't think it's necessary um, for everybody and all the time. I think for some people, they need to do more. Um, other people, they can just keep on with life and that's the best thing that they can do as well. So um, I think it's always better to make positive lifestyle changes for overall health, uh, but I don't think you always need to either. Okay. The last post says, having bad conditioning or bad condition of mattress you are using may cause you lower back pain. The mattress we have on there. May cause. Once again, we're playing with, with semantics here. Um, I think that could be a factor because if, if it's so bad that you're not sleeping well, we know not sleeping well oftentimes can predispose people to pain. But um, once again, you know, evolutionary speaking, like we've had ancestors that sleep on the floor and on the ground and in, in terrible conditions. So I, I don't think we can just say that we have to be in one sleeping position or anything of that sort. So I, th I think it could be a contributor. Um, causation would be harder to, to draw from that. Okay, well, bingo, you have cleared all the myths and facts for the audience to know. Okay, moving on, Dr. Ben, coming to the treatment process. Now, why, you know, what are some ways by which my listeners and viewers 
can understand their pain very well because somehow i have felt that maybe some people are suffering from injuries in their lower back pain and some are having the normal lower back pain so what is the way to understand you know what exactly the pain they are suffering from and how they would manage that yeah exactly yeah so you know from a from a clin I'll, I'll try to answer this from a clinical standpoint and then maybe just from a a, a self care standpoint um, which is going to tie into self management, but it'd be a little bit different. So from a clinical standpoint, we always want to make sure we're ruling out red flags first. So fractures, cancers, infections, spinal, uh, uh, upper motor neuron, spinal cord issues, lower motor neuron as well. But, um, as long as those things are not on board, which is going to be one to 3%, maybe 5% on, of the research that you read, um, one to 5% of overall low back pain. Everything else is going to be a pretty good prognosis overall. Um, that doesn't mean that everybody is going to get, you know, better right away, but um, many folks will. And one of the best things you can do is just continue on with your life as normal. Um, there, there are still movements that you can do to, to kind of modify things. I always like to use the sunburn analogy where I'm, I'm pretty pale and uh, we don't have a lot of sun here in Michigan right now. So if I go outside in maybe three months when we do get some sun and I go out there for too long after being inside for too long, I'm going to get sunburned, right? Just like um, some low back pain. Now, what do I do about that? Well, if I just come inside for a little bit, I let things calm down, right? It doesn't mean that I'm not living still or anything of like that, but I'm not doing the sensitizing activities over and over and over again. I'm giving a little bit of break. Then as I calm down, now I start to gradually go outside, maybe five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day, 30 minutes, an hour, and I build up some pigment. So now I can tolerate the sun a little bit more as well. So same thing with low back pain. Once we do get sensitized, once we do get sunburnt metaphorically, we can avoid some activities that are, that are aggravating short term, very important that it's short term. And then once things calm down a little bit, now I can start to re-engage with those. But we want to keep life as normal as possible. Um, the one thing we, we know across the board, across all guidelines, US, Australia, um, UK, Canada, you name it, everybody is always talking about imaging just because we're, we're so, uh, so used to imaging. We're, we're kind of uh, enamored with with this fancy technology technology right so we all want image we want to find the root cause but um, what we know about imaging is is early imaging across the board results in increased risk of opioids increased risk risk of surgery longer length of overall care increased disability increased health care costs um, and that was the jacob study from 2020 or 2021 i believe so we, we the one thing we know is we don't want to image we want to temporarily avoid some aggravating factors but keep life as, as is similar to their normal life as possible. Stay in work, stay hanging out with your friends, things of that sort. Now, you know, hopefully folks can see a clinician to make sure those red flags aren't there. That way they can have somebody that they communicate with. Um, that kind of gets into self-management, how the clinician and the patient can kind of collaborate and communicate to come up with a game plan um, and help guide them through this process and give them some, some actual strategies that they can use when this does come back because it, it oftentimes will come back and when it does come back if they have some strategies that they can use to to mitigate that and to kind of weather that storm that's going to increase their autonomy oftentimes it's going to increase the self-efficacy there is a little bit of debate in the research um, some studies we see that we can increase self-efficacy some studies we don't but we do know self-efficacy and autonomy how confident they feel that they can handle this is one of the biggest predictors of how well they're going to do short term and especially as um, we're looking at people transitioning from acute to chronic pain overall. So we really want to make sure we're giving them strategies so that they can self-manage this later on in the in the future, but also still leaving our door open to collaborate if they do need some assistance with that. Now, if they are just somebody that is, you know, they haven't seen a healthcare practitioner, things of that sort, you know, the, the low-hanging fruit is making sure that they're taking care of themselves. They're sleeping well. They have some type of exercise routine, things of that sort. Um, oftentimes, they're staying away from Google. They're watching good content videos, um, things like you, you, uh, things like E3 Rehab has some really good videos to get good information. Because oftentimes, when they're having pain, they immediately look and they go online and they find something that, that scares the heck out of them. It just really makes their pain worse and, and makes their a prognosis worse overall. So those are some of the biggest things, but really keeping life as normal as possible. But it can be helpful to see that clinician just to make sure we don't have any of that 5% of things going on and then really laying out that game plan that you can kind of collaborate with. Absolutely. Here, I would also like to remind everyone who's listening and watching this episode to make sure 
whom to follow on Instagram and TikTok because everything you see on social media is not always true. Do follow professionals like Dr. Ben who will be giving you first-hand valid information about any problem. Moving on, Dr. Ben, last but not the least, what will be Dr. Ben's biggest piece of advice to manage lower back pain to our listeners and viewers? Oh man. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. You know, it's easier said than done. Um, my, my immediate thought was, was don't panic. Um, but that's so much easier said than done. Even, you know, I, I teach this stuff. Um, we travel around the country talking to, to, to folks about this, uh, clinicians and, and trainers. And even, you know, I, I'm pretty confident with, with managing low back pain and with this, but even when that happens, when I do go through some low back pain, which happens a couple times a year, I still have some of those thoughts come on board. Like, oh gosh, maybe, maybe this is worse than I think. Maybe I did, uh, you know, do something really nasty to my spine, things of this sort. Maybe I should get an image. So even when we have, you know, the best information we can, not saying I, I have all that, right? There's definitely gaps, but, uh, you know, even when you are in that clinician role, it can still be daunting when you do go through this pain experience. So I think one of the best pieces of advice I could have is to have somebody in your corner that you can trust. You know, it, it doesn't have to be someone that you see all the time, um, but you have a clinician or a friend or a healthcare provider that, that you can turn to to um, kind of bring you back to, to the, the, good, the good prognosis, the good natural history, um, the straight and narrow path versus really kind of cycling on all the normal thoughts that come with this as far as fear and worry and apprehension and all the things that we know can really muddy the waters um, and, and make that prognosis a little bit less promising. Absolutely. Well, with this, we have come to an end of this episode. I know today's episode have given has given a lot of views and aspects for you to think about your lower back pain, your lifestyle, and all the thoughts you had in your mind about your lower back pain. Thank you so much, Dr. Ben, for joining in and taking your time from your schedule to speak to my audience and me. This was a super hit episode and I am really grateful for you to send and to give all the information that you had for lower back pain. I really hope you enjoyed this and you had as much fun as we had listening to you. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. This is your reminder to straighten your back, have a glass of water and move. Also, a pro tip, see the red flags in your health. Do not ignore them as you ignore them in your life. See the red flags of your health. We'll see in the next episode. Till then, goodbye. Take care.